Don Quixote, I live on peyote, marijuana, morphine, and cocaine. I never know sadness, but only a madness that burns at the heart and the brain. This is Aurora Seco, a 30 mile long canyon in Los Angeles County, California, located on the fringes of the city of Pasadena. The small dry stream from which the canyon derives its name in Spanish, was dammed in 1920 with what became known as the Devil's Gate, which itself was named after a local rock formation which is said to resemble the face of a devil at the narrowest part of the canyon. Aurora Seco, even to this day, remains something of a striking contradiction, a punctuated wilderness within the sprawling vast urban landscape surrounding Los Angeles. A reminder of what the City of the Angels looked like before the god of gold, oil and dreams of Hollywood neophytes made the region what it was to become in the centuries following the arrival of the Spanish explorers into that canyon. Aurora Seco forever remaining a repository of all the collective souls who passed through this mysterious landscape including the dozens of suicides during the Great Depression, when failed American dreamers threw themselves off the Colorado Street Bridge and into the mouth of the Devil's Gate below. From conquistadors to failed movie stars, Aurora Seco has known them all. And it was into this very landscape on All Saints Day 1936 that Jack Parsons and his lifelong friend and colleague Ed Foreman, both fresh from celebrating a Halloween Founders Nativity as it was called, at the nearby Jet Propulsion Laboratory, came to Aurora Seco to conduct yet one more test of another prototype rocket motor. These young men were also in their element. Both men had cut their teeth as young boys launching homemade rockets from Parsons' mother's backyard and into the sky above the millionaire's mansions of pastoral Pasadena. Having scoured night and day the factories and chemical suppliers of the LA area, their rudimentary machines, although constructed from plumbing supplies and homemade chemical mixtures, would eventually lead from the scorch marks of exploded rockets on Pasadena lawns to the footprints of Neil Armstrong upon the lunar surface. It was very literally as much alchemy as it was rocketry. These young men were true pioneers, true scientists, and were extremely diligent about their experimentation. The research is conducted with the view of ascertaining the application of the rocket to altitude exploration and other fields, the properties of various fuels and of metals at high temperatures. Rockets to be investigated are solid fuel rockets utilizing explosives or combustibles and liquid rockets employing liquid explosives or liquid or gaseous oxygen and various combustibles. Jack Parsons in particular was despite his outwardly laissez-faire and charismatic personality, very much a serious scientist who left nothing to chance. He was well regarded by professors and academic scientists as an individual who applied caution when dealing with potentially dangerous substances and equipment. So it came as some surprise when on the third attempt to start a rocket motor that the fuel hose connecting to the nozzle mysteriously came loose and danced like a fire elemental in every direction almost immolating Parsons and the team who scurried out of the way as it lashed to and fro among the improvised outside laboratory. Metaphorically, Parsons had conjured a devil and he had survived. Not unlike the non-material devil which he claimed to have unleashed as a child when he first began his experimentation with magic and conjuration. Yet the fiery elemental Unleashed in Aurora Seco that afternoon, no more altered Parsons' desire to put a man on the moon and explore the reaches of the cosmos 
that his initial terrifying experimentation with the magical sciences would later prevent him from exploring the limits of space-time and human consciousness. In fact, the remarkable achievements of America's space program would hardly have been possible without Jack Parsons the rocket scientist and Jack Parsons the occultist. As the guns of the Western Front were only commencing their murderous overture of the Great War in Europe, and also on the precise date that Jehovah Witnesses founder Charles Taze Russell proclaimed that the apocalypse would begin, Marvel Whiteside Parsons was born on October 2nd, 1914 at the Good Samaritan Hospital in downtown Los Angeles. Later on in life, when he became more commonly known as Jack, would Parsons often joke among friends and colleagues that he was born on the same day as the Antichrist. Little did he know then, that in the eyes of evangelical Christians and even to the present, this was not far from how some came to see the brilliant rocket scientist, who not only helped shape the destiny of American outer space, but also being instrumental with putting the first man on the surface of the moon. The adult Jack Parsons would also go on to create both the prestigious Jet Propulsion Laboratory as well as the Aerojet Company, and along the way come into contact with some of the most influential, if unorthodox, figures of the 20th century. There was nowhere else on earth more suited than Los Angeles during the first quarter of the 20th century for someone such as Jack Parsons to be born and raised in. A landscape of impossible and possible dreams, made manifest among a growing urban landscape filled with both endless opportunities for personal glory and, it has to be said, annihilation. At the time of Parsons' birth, Los Angeles was beginning to take its place as the steadily sharpening knife edge of emerging Western culture. Not only was Jack Parsons being born, but so too the reputation of Los Angeles was also being born within the world's consciousness as the movie studios began their march towards becoming global empires under the shadow of the Hollywood Hills. As his wealthy parents, having recently arrived from Puritan New England, took the young Marvel Whiteside Parsons to their new home on Scarf Street in downtown Los Angeles, that their hearts would have been filled with promise and hope for their young son and his life ahead. Yet, in a very short time, the Parsons household was to be torn asunder. When his parents soon divorced after his father admitted to having visited prostitutes, The divorce was so visceral due to the nature of his father's transgression that his mother forbade the father, Marvel H. Parsons, from ever seeing his son again. This somewhat cruel situation resulted in Marvel Jr., now called John and soon to be known as Jack, spending the rest of his life longing for the father figure he'd never had growing up. And along with this, 
a strong and sincere attachment to his adoring mother Ruth. Soon after the divorce, Jack's mother's parents moved to California in order to spend more time with their daughter and grandson. All four moved into a new house in Pasadena among the orange groves and millionaires of this fashionable and affluent city. Parson's social status was such that he even spoke with a slight English accent from having contact with the family servants. Moving to Pasadena from Los Angeles also opened up the young Parson's emerging consciousness to reading, in particular mythologies, legends and fantasy, and most important of all, the genre known as weird fiction or scientific romances, later to be called science fiction. A passion which Parsons retained for the rest of his life, even going as far as joining Los Angeles area clubs devoted to this very popular form of pulp fiction, and where he most likely also came upon more formal insights into his interest in the occult and the paranormal. Magazines such as Astounding Tales and Weird Tales became the Parsons almost literal grimoires of not merely fantastical machines and interplanetary travel, but very real aspirational tones of actual future events when man would indeed develop the technology to explore space. It was somewhere in between the stories of H.P. Lovecraft and Jules Verne that Jack Parsons the Rocketeer was gestated. As Parsons grew, his affluent and somewhat sheltered life came to an end when he attended Washington Junior High School. Here he struggled with dyslexia and constant bullying. It was while he was being beaten up by a school bully one afternoon that a pupil named Ed Foreman came to his rescue. Foreman, despite being from a poor working class background, nevertheless struck up an instant camaraderie with the young Parsons. A friendship which they were to share for the remainder of Parsons life. Driven by their collective fascination with science fiction and space travel, the two boys soon began making homemade rockets. Some of their early attempts were at Aurora Seco, which became something of a blank canvas upon which the two boys painted their future intentions in outer space. Aurora Seco itself taking on a kind of mystical quality and a location where they were to turn as real rocket scientists later on in their lives. The two boys began using the motto Per Aspera Ad Astra, translated from Latin into English, through hardship to the stars. And this became an incantation of their desire to reach escape velocity and bring man into the cosmos. On the cusp of the Great Depression, the family moved to a house on San Rafael Avenue, but now this new home became witness to the family's declining economic fortunes. From first-class tours of Europe and servants waiting on him, Parsons, now in his late teens, became acutely aware of the economic hardships the family were enduring for the first time in his life. Continuing his studies, with the intention of entering into the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech, Parsons took a job working at the Hercules Powder Company. Despite his affluent upbringing, Jack Parsons demonstrated no sense of snobbery among his blue-collar workmates. His natural inclination towards decency and common respect for others made him well-liked within the factory environment. This empathy for the working classes would later have Parsons flirting with communism. However, his heart always remaining deeply with his two great passions, rocketry and science fiction. Working at the Hercules Powder Company was also providing a valuable paid education of sorts for Parsons, as he became more and more familiar 
with working with chemicals and explosives. The dangerous nature of the employment also afforded him a very good salary for the era. This not only allowed him to save up for college tuition, but also for both himself and Ed Foreman to continue their rocketry experiments at Aurora Seco. Having developed a moderately successful solid fuel rocket, Parsons and Foreman then began personal technical correspondence with established rocket scientists of the era, including phone calls to Werner von Braun in Germany, who struck up a rapport with the young Parsons as the soon-to-be rocket scientist of the Third Reich and later the chief of NASA's Apollo program also shared a common love of science fiction. It was as if these science fiction stories of future technology and outer space exploration appealed to these rocket pioneers beyond that of them being merely escapism or entertainment, as both Parsons and Von Braun, subconsciously at least, considered science fiction to be akin to a sacred school of occultic knowledge, sequestered just beyond the periphery of present scientific achievements. Science fiction took these men out of the present space-time and into a yet-to-be-resolved future world, allowing both to achieve something of an escape velocity from the present scientific orthodoxy all around them. From these conversations, Parsons soon found that German rocket engineering was far more advanced than what was happening in the USA. Parsons saw this to his advantage as the war in Europe loomed ever closer. Military money and support for his experiments would eventually be there to allow his work to continue so as to match the advances being made in Germany. However, for Parsons, now in his early 20s, things went from bad to worse as the Great Depression took an even more profound toll among the family's fortunes. And as Parsons graduated from university school in 1933, yet another move was required to a more typically suburban home on St. John Avenue. Parsons' hopes of attaining an associate degree had also all but vanished. As a result, Parsons was forced to take up full-time position at the Hercules Powder Company. Even so, along with Foreman, they still managed to obtain use of Caltech's off-campus laboratory and equipment to develop liquid fuel rockets this time. Having been joined by PhD student Frank Molina, the group called themselves the Galsit Rocket Research Group. However, the badly needed research funds simply were not there in the economic climate of the period, and this badly thwarted the group's ambitions. Regardless of their financial difficulties, a solid bond of genuine friendship and common interest held the group together, irrespective of their poor financial situation. It was also around this time that Parsons met the first of his father figures, in the guise of Caltech's Hungarian aerospace engineer and physicist Theodor von Karman. Von Karman took an instant liking to the young eccentric Parsons now in his twenties, and whom the professor respected despite the fact that the Pasadena native had no formal degree. Understanding of Jack Parsons' economic situation, von Karman did all he could to help out both Parsons and his rocket group at a time when rockets were considered a dead or eccentric science. The United States in particular having become enamoured with aircraft and aviation due to the exploits the Howard Hughes and even being captivated by the huge German airships which floated above American cities in the pre-war years, all of which had reduced the field of rocketry and rocket engineering to an antiquated or an eccentric pursuit. The terms rocket scientist or space cadet becoming literal slurs to denote a mad professor or an educated lunatic. Nevertheless, Theodor von Karman saw something in Parsons 
and upon finding out about Parsons' interest in paranormal subjects, told the young rocketeer that he was a direct descendant of Judah Lo Ben Bezael, the famous 15th century rabbi mystic of Bohemia, who went on to create the Golem of Prague so as to defend the Jewish ghetto in the city from a pogrom. This connection between science and mysticism must have been incredibly exciting to Jack Parsons. On the other hand, Van Karman enjoyed Parsons' jovial and relaxed personality when compared to the then uptight nature of academic life within Caltech itself. In the summer of 1934, Jack Parsons met an attractive young woman named Helen Northrup, and in April 1935, the two became married at the Little Church of the Flowers in Glendale. They made their home in South Terrace Drive, Pasadena, while Parsons took up employment at the Halifax Powder Company at their facility in Saugus. Despite the young couple being financially crippled, Parsons still directed some of his wages towards the Galsit Rocket Research Group, while also earning extra money by manufacturing dangerous chemicals at home and selling them himself. It wasn't long before Helen realised that Galsit was as important in her husband's life as their marriage, and it was something she deeply resented, but accepted this situation nonetheless. Yet there was so much to be positive about as the continuing rocket fuel experiments under the Devil's Gate in Aurora Seco was starting to pay off for the group, now nicknaming themselves the Suicide Squad, and they were given permission to work at the Caltech campus itself, availing of all the technical, laboratory and other infrastructural opportunities available to them on site. This boosted Parsons' own self-esteem and confidence greatly as now he was ostensibly a genuine rocket researcher at a top university. However, his official status at Caltech was to move Jack Parsons' life into an entirely new direction in which both his personality and genius, not to mention his good looks, charisma and charm, were to make him famous all over the USA. Following a donation of $1,000, the Suicide Squad had finally procured a modest level of funding. Nonetheless, this sum of money actually sustained the basic costs and material expenses of the group for some years to come. The ambitious young rocketeers also gained an unfavorable reputation for loud explosions and potentially dangerous experiments on the campus at Caltech. But there was little or no formal complaints directed their way. Then a twist of fate would place the rocket group into the national spotlight when their expertise was called upon in a high profile criminal case which shocked Los Angeles at the time. Presumably because he legitimately was the top expert on explosives at Caltech, Jack Parsons was called upon to give his testimony at a trial concerning the attempted car bomb murder of a private investigator and former LAPD detective by the name of Harry Raymond. Raymond at the time was investigating criminal activities leading all the way up to the mayor's office. Incredibly, Raymond had survived the explosion caused by the car bomb, even so he had been hit with over 150 pieces of shrapnel. A secret police group within the LAPD had been tailing Redmond for several weeks and it came as no surprise to many when his vehicle was bombed. As he was making very powerful and dangerous enemies as the complexity of the investigation developed. The case was so damning 
that it was referred to as an oak tree of political corruption, costing Los Angeles many thousands of dollars as it looked deeply into all sorts of dark elements of the city's corruption. On the stand, expert witness, 23-year-old Jack Parsons, wooed both the media and courtroom with his knowledge, confidence and charisma. At one point, he made a replica of the bomb used in the murder attempt, which was then used to blow up a car during a demonstration in the desert. Parsons' expertise and likability became a dream come true for the prosecution, as he provided very specific technical details and evidence to assure an eventual guilty verdict. Under cross-examination, he was also highly confident, and the media soon gravitated towards the young rocket engineer, both for his ability to provide copy inches for the reporters, as well as his almost Hollywood photogenic attributes for the front pages. At the end of the sensational trial, Earl Kenyett was convicted of murder and was sentenced to serve from two years to life in prison. Police Chief Davis was forced into retirement. Joe Shaw, the mayor's brother, was charged with selling city resources, while the mayor himself left office in disgrace. Parsons' involvement in the case, however, some believe may have gained the young rocket boy, as the media called him, dangerous elements to deal with in the future. can we come to wisdom again. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. To the classical Greeks and Romans, the daemon was considered a kind of genius or guiding spirit who whispered into the subconscious world of great thinkers and artists. Whispers which then allowed these mortals to transcend their earthly constraints of creativity and intellect, so as to lead or inspire the human, under the guidance of this muse, into new levels of greatness and experiences beyond the shackles of the material universe or the present orthodoxy. Jack Parsons' life story was the very epitome of faith and destiny, as if he himself was subject to some hidden hand or powerful daemon that was guiding his own life towards specific locations, events and individuals. A chance encounter with a John Baxter developed out of a shared interest in magic and the paranormal due to Parsons having read Alistair Crowley's Knox Own Pax. The title of the text is derived from a phrase in ancient Egyptian which translates as light rushing out in a single ray. As the friendship between Baxter and Jack Parsons developed, 
he eventually took the Parsons along with John's sisters Frances to a ceremony known as the Gnostic Mass at the Church of Thelema underneath the famous Hollywood sign. The Gnostic Mass, or Book 15, as it is also known, was written by Alistair Crowley, the great beast 666 himself, who by this time had already established his reputation in the eyes of many as the greatest occultist on earth and to some the wickedest man in the world. Within the Gnostic Mass, the high altar is orientated towards the direction of Boleskine House in Scotland on the shores of Loch Ness home of the famous monster and the location where Crowley performed the notorious magical operation of the sacred magic of Abermelon the Mage, derived from a grimoire called the Book of Abermelon. As a result, Crowley had made Boleskine House akin to something of a Jerusalem within the Gnostic Mass and hence the specific orientation of the High Altar towards this location in Scotland. The Gnostic Mass itself is highly theatrical and ritualized in a manner similar to the Catholic Latin Mass, even down to the sanctification and consumption of a Eucharist. Along with this, the Gnostic Mass outlines the rite of crossing the abyss and encountering the Egyptian goddess Nut. There are also invocations of the crowned and conquered child of the new Aeon, venerations of the pagan god Pan, as well as prayers directed towards the sun, chaos, air, Babylon, Baphomet, and all this being amalgamated into what at the time would have been considered a spectacular act of heresy, and one which left a deep impression upon both Jack Parsons and his wife Helen. I believe in one secret and ineffable Lord, and in one star in the company of stars of whose fire we are created, and to which we shall return, and in one Father of life, mystery of mystery, in his name, Chaos, the sole vicegerent of the sun upon the earth, and in one air, the nourisher of all that breathes. And I believe in one earth, the mother of us all, and in one womb wherein all men are begotten, and wherein they shall rest, mystery of mystery, in her name, Babylon. And I believe in the serpent and the lion, mystery of mystery, in his name, Baphomet. And I believe in one Gnostic and Catholic church of light, life, love, and liberty, the word of whose law is Thelema. And I believe in the communion of saints, and for as much as meat and drink are transmuted in us daily into spiritual substance, I believe in the miracle of the Mass. And I confess one baptism of wisdom, whereby we accomplish the miracle of incarnation. And I confess my life one, individual, and eternal that was, and is, and is to come. Oh. Oh. The Gnostic Mass, known colloquially as Crowley Night on Winona Boulevard, attracted all manner of artists, bohemian types and Hollywood actors, including John Carradine, who was known to read aloud Crowley's poem, O Madonna of the Golden Eyes. To madness, love's swift purpose darts the flesh of the striking adder. Love that kills and kills dwells above the satin dust. Dawn brings reason back and the violet eyes grow sadder. O oh, Madonna of the golden eyes. Swoon to deep sunlight above the summer stream. Drone the sleepy dragonfly by the water spring. Stood in the new tide in a misty dream, fearful of our voices, of some sudden things, O oh Madonna of the Golden Eyes. 
At the Agape Lodge on Winona Boulevard, a Jack and Helen Parsons also met Wilfred Talbot Smith and Regina Carl, who had founded the Winona OTO Agape Lodge. Parsons became close with Regina Carl and Wilfred Talbot Smith. Smith, having been the founder of the Agape Lodge, arrived from England via Vancouver. Although Parsons did find Smith both interesting and knowledgeable, he was also cautious and wary of the founder of the lodge. As Parsons' interest in the work and writings of Alistair Crowley deepened, specifically in terms of the nature and application of ritual magic, and also being somewhat a man of science, he came to believe that the magical events and occurrences contained within the work of Crowley and other sorcerers could be explained within the field of quantum theory. Along with this, Parsons became somewhat evangelical about the rituals and performances at the Agape Lodge and occasionally badgered his friends to join him for performances of the Gnostic Mass. Most took no interest in attending or merely laughed off the Crowley Night on Winona Boulevard. Except for one Caltech student named Grady Lewis McMurtry and Parsons' sister-in-law Sarah Betty Northrup. Once again, the daemon within Parsons' subconscious had whispered the roadmap of faith and destiny into his psyche, and this time there was to be no turning back. The Establishment of Thelema Through the Rituals of Love The Parsons were eventually initiated into the Agape Lodge in February 1941. Parsons accepted the mantra of the establishment of Thelema through the rituals of love, the initials of which spelled out T-O-P-A-N, also served as a declaration to Pan, the wild pagan fertility god of Arcadia, and to whom Parsons would develop a strong affinity towards for the rest of his life. Parsons now Freighter Tupan, which also resolved itself into 210 within Kabbalistic numerology, soon proved himself to be an influential and inspiring figure within the Agape Lodge. So much so that Smith, in his letters to Alistair Crowley, declared Jack Parsons of a superior intellect to anyone else within the Lodge and even some went as far as proposing that Parsons become the natural successor to Aleister Crowley as the future head of the OTO. Even Crowley himself was equally impressed with Parsons from reports and correspondences forwarded to him, eventually coming to realise that Jack Parsons was the most important Thelemite within the entire order. The now mutual appreciation between Parsons and Smith would lead the FBI suggesting a bisexual relationship between the two men. However, this was almost certainly a prejudicial slur made against Parsons as part of the Bureau's overall suspicion of the rocket engineer who also took an interest in communism as well as his occultism. Within the Agape Lodge itself, Parsons' charm, likability and intellect, and even his sense of humour, was also beguiling the other members of the Order. 
the former silent movie star Sarah Jane Wolfe, who was one of the initial founders of the Winona Boulevard Lodge, had been a personal associate of Alistair Crowley and was, at one time, living with the great beast 666 himself inside the legendary Abbey of Thelema at Kefalu in Sicily. Having taken the Oath of the Abyss, she would go on to become one of the most influential and important players in the development of magic during the 20th century. By the time Parsons had arrived at the Agape Lodge, she was considered something of an elder crone or maven. And immediately she also saw the potential and ability of the dazzling rocket engineer from Pasadena, being especially impressed with his knowledge of art and music. Parsons, ever the polymath, was finding his place within the Agape Lodge with the same proficiency and confidence as which he was attaining within the field of rocket engineering. Along with all this, Parsons started to take his passion for science fiction even more seriously, coming to fully understand the magical power of the genre's imaginative force upon affecting the trajectory of future events as a result of these concepts being focused within one's will. One book in particular was Jack Williamson's Darker Than You Think, and this left a deep impression upon Parsons. The book's plotline revolves around the shamanic people who have the ability to shapeshift into animals at will, and that the tribe were survivors of a race of werewolves who, having been defeated by Homo sapiens, managed to survive into the modern world by assuming the form of normal humans. The novel itself incorporates very magical ideas of concentration, will, and altered states of being as well as concepts surrounding the esoteric nature of Lucifer, paganism and witchcraft. However, what struck Parsons most was the character of April Bell, who encapsulated the very concept of the Holy Whore of Babylon, which Jack Parsons sought to bring into earthly manifestation. Even the cover artwork and illustrations of Jack Williamson's Darker Than You Think were to have a profound impact upon Jack Parsons' psyche and eventual magical destiny. The first sliver of the Crescent Moonchild was finally shining within Parsons' soul, and from this point on the Babylon working became as important to him as the ability for a rocket to achieve escape velocity and to reach the moon. The moon itself and the Moonchild were becoming mutually inclusive within Parsons' consciousness. Along with his success within the world of magic and his personal spiritual development, Parsons' career and research into rocketry was likewise taking off. Funding from the US Army Air Corps to develop a small rocket motor to propel aircraft off short runways resulted in the Jet Assisted Takeoff or JATO project being developed. Literally the first ever rocket research program directly endorsed and funded by the US government. However, due to increasing damage and disruptions being done upon Caltech by the Suicide Squad and their experiments, the group were forced to return to Parsons and Foreman's childhood laboratory in the shadow of the Devil's Gate Dam at Aurora Seco. There they constructed a pair of shacks which would become the first offices of what was to become the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL, as it became more commonly known. Remarkably, the Jato Grant had resulted in two childhood friends, Jack Parsons and Ed Foreman, ostensibly beginning the first stage of what would become Neil Armstrong's footsteps upon the lunar surface utilizing the same location where as young boys they launched makeshift rockets inspired from science fiction stories 
having fermented such ideas within their eager young minds. The magical destiny of what they were now achieving would not have been lost upon Jack Parsons. Now officially a US government rocket scientist, very literally Parsons would have been acutely aware that it was all something of a magical ritual progressing through each stage of development in a similar manner to which a magical ceremony would progress from one stage to the next as the will of the Magi became focused into greater and more potent streams of magical energy. Aurora Seco was now no longer merely a piece of useful wasteland in which to test rockets within the urban sprawl of the Los Angeles region. Aurora Seco had become literally a temple. In July 1941, the Galsit Chateau team, now having switched to liquid fuel rockets, were ready for their prototype testing. After the final technical issues were solved by Frank Molina, an A-20A plane at the Murak Auxiliary Airfield in the Mojave Desert fired its attached rocket and shot off at high speed into the blue sky. The test was a resounding success impressing both the Suicide Squad themselves and the military. This led to the US Army Air Corps ordering 60 JATO liquid fuel rocket motors. This in turn led to the formation of the Aerojet Corporation with the intention of producing rockets capable of reaching outer space. At last, Jack Parsons now had so much he had desired for in life a stable financial income for him and Helen, a successful business, respect as a government rocket scientist, and something of an extended family within the Gap A Lodge. And also, Smith, increasingly fulfilling the father figure archetype, which Jack Parsons subconsciously longed for. The gods seemed to be smiling upon Freighter Tupan and all his endeavors. Remember that the tarot is a great and sacred arcanum. Its abuse is an obscenity in the inner and a folly in the outer. It is intended for quite other purposes than to determine when the tall dark man will meet the fair rich widow. In the era before the hippie free love culture of the 1960s, individuals seeking a more sexually liberated lifestyle were often drawn to occultic circles. As the harnessing and release of sexual energy is considered a potent power force within many forms of ritual magic, the OTO was anything but an exception to this belief. So sexual liberation and permissiveness being constantly encouraged by Crowley was part and parcel of life inside the Agape Lodge. It was a direct result of this erotic liberation that in June 1941, Jack Parsons began a sexual relationship with his sister-in-law Sarah Northrup. Sarah, who was 17 at the time, declared herself to be Parsons' new wife 
and Parsons themselves proclaimed that the sexual relationship with Sarah in no way affected Jack's underlying genuine love for Helen. Although Helen generally agreed that sexual liberation and freedom were an important aspect in one's spiritual journey, it was perhaps that her husband and younger sister had taken this upon themselves which caused her some agitation. Helen would have found Jack being with any other woman apart from her younger sister Sarah being far more permissible. As a result, Helen then embarked on her own sexual relationship with Wilfred Smith, which by all accounts became a happy and loving one, and which led to the two couples finding resolution and contentment within this new arrangement. All four of them, along with some other individuals and families, moved into a beautiful and grand residence at 1003 South Orange Grove Boulevard in Pasadena. All residents paying $100 a month to live in one of the most fashionable and wealthy neighborhoods in all of California. This den became the new home of the Agape Lodge, in many ways a community ahead of its time in terms of being self-sufficient by growing their own food and raising their own livestock. One can only imagine the reaction such a situation created among the respectable residents of such an affluent community coming face to face with a bohemian commune complete with its own farm and special areas set aside for fairies to occupy and inhabit. Along with this, there were more prosaic pursuits were undertaken by Parsons there, as he built his own laboratory on the site in order to continue his chemical research into rocket propellants. By now, Parsons was enjoying a respectable income from Aerojet, and he donated all of his disposable income to the OTO. This included financial support to the aging and ailing Alistair Crowley in London. At the same time, his friendship with Ed Foreman remained as strong as ever, with Foreman now taking an active role himself in the Agape Lodge. However, the activities at 1003 South Orange Grove Boulevard was also impacting upon professional obligations with Aerojet, and while initially it did not create any serious conflict nor animosity between the eccentric Parsons and his colleagues, his compulsion to use magical language and phraseology during rocket tests clearly demonstrated that his scientific enterprise and his occultic beliefs were by this point indistinguishable from one another. Although at the time this no more than amused and confused the more conservative Frank Molina. There were other problems with Parsons taking Aerojet staff to parties at the lodge and as a result they all showing up at hangovers the following morning. Even Theodore von Karman, who had always expressed a great fondness for Parsons, was unhappy with this situation, especially as Parsons had moved from alcohol and marijuana and onto harder drugs and hallucinogenics. Meanwhile, among the wealthy residents of South Orange Grove, the Agape Lodge was becoming under the scrutiny of the local curtain twitchers who made reports to the Pasadena Police Department of many indecent goings-on at the location. The police were unable to find any sign of illegal activity within the lodge and generally put the reports down to neighborhood talk and gossip. Even so, within the walls of the magnificent American craftsman-style mansion, the ongoing sexual activity among the Agape members continued unabated. Parsons impregnated Claire McMurtry and paid for her to have an abortion, which in turn infuriated her husband, turning him against Parsons for the first time in their friendship. Keeping an eye on all this from afar and eager to see Jack Parsons take over as head of the Agape Lodge in Pasadena, Alistair Crowley in London devised a plan to have Wilfred Smith removed as head of the lodge. Jack Parsons was clearly becoming the golden boy of the OTO, as Crowley was as equally impressed with his scientific endeavours as his magical ones. Considering the young polymath from Pasadena being the one individual who could lead the organisation into the future. Smith, on the other hand, 
was becoming viewed more and more akin to some Victorian throwback, to the days of the old magical orders such as the Golden Dawn, while Parsons was considered the emerging Magus who could take Thelema into outer space within the post-World War II scientific age of wonders. There were clearly two factions now emerging within the Agape Lodge, Smith representing tradition and Jack Parsons representing the future. As a result, Smith had to be removed as leader. Acting as a third party within this emerging dynamic, Jane Wolfe wrote to Crowley informing him that Parsons was emerging as an almost organic leader within the Lodge. The hammer of change was now firmly striking the anvil of tradition within inside the OTO. In order to achieve this transition, Alistair Crowley devised a magical quest for Smith to embark upon. Following the birth of Wilfred Smith and Helen's child, Crowley managed to convince Smith that by means of some significant astrological deductions, that Wilfred Smith himself was in fact the reincarnation of a god. Although this was done to a degree as a plan to put Parsons in control of the Agape Lodge, however even Crowley believed that Smith was indeed a remarkable spiritual incarnation and instructed him to seek his divinity with a long meditative retreat. Although this caused Smith to resign from his role within the Agape Lodge, contrary to it creating extra conflict, Jack Parsons is both sympathetic and supportive to Smith and the two men's friendship and mutual respect remained as strong as ever. Among Lodge members, Smith was already being referred to as the Unknown God, indicating that Crowley's astrological findings were being taken very seriously. In order to ease tensions and possibly at Parsons' request, Crowley wrote to Smith pleading with him not to resign and for him to remain central to the Agape Lodge's spiritual workings. As the situation developed, Crowley himself even wondered if Smith's unknown god was a result of Crowley's 1914 Paris working, leading even some to speculate that Wilfred Smith might even have been Pan, who was born by annihilation to be born into chaos, where Pan is the saviour entering into Smith at the start of World War I. Regardless of any astrological authenticity, or for that matter Crowley's diplomacy, the damage had been done and Crowley and Parsons both accepted that things had to come to a head. Despite objections from some Lodge members that Parsons was not fit for purpose of leading the community due to his drug taking and womanising, Crowley nonetheless appointed Jack Parsons as acting head of the Agape Lodge, which was now becoming known as the Parsonage. Parsons' rise within the OTO was in no doubt influenced by his growing success as a scientist and businessman. Now in the middle of the Second World War, as Werner von Braun's V2 rockets were landing in the streets around Crowley's London residence, the US government handed Parsons and the Galsit team a staggering $3 million grant to develop rocket bombs to rival the German V2s. At the same time, huge orders for Jato rocket motors were coming in resulting in significant outside investment flowing into Aerojet, making them a major government defence contractor. This situation then changed everything within the company, and although the group had begun from humble and frugal beginnings, the status of respectability was now firmly established, and this image had to be maintained as more and more military officers and government representatives could be seen in the offices and work areas in and around Aerojet. That between their alternative occultic lifestyles, as well as constantly showing up to work with hangovers, it was decided that Jack Parsons and Ed Foreman, literally the two men who had created it all from their childhood experiments, were to be removed from the company. Both also being young, good-looking, charming and now successful, the two had been working their way through the female staff at the company to the point whereby nearly the entire secretarial department at Aerojet 
had had affairs with both Parsons and Foreman. This situation infuriated others on the management team, and so they both had to go. Parsons and Foreman, being both confident individuals, took the announcement casually, and both were financially well compensated for the dismissal. This also ended their friendship with Frank Molina, as the social and intellectual schisms had become amplified towards an unattainable level. The financial golden handshake finally led Parsons to purchase the lease on the parsonage at 1003 South Orange Grove Boulevard, thus bringing a level of long-term security to the lodge, which helped to ease considerably the fallout which had taken place with the removal of Wilfred Smith as leader. Jack Parsons, ironically, was now becoming something of a father figure in his own right. Ron Hubbard is a gentleman. He has red hair, green eyes, is honest and intelligent, and we've become great friends. He moved in with me about two months ago, and although Betty and I are still friendly, she has transferred her sexual affection to Ron. Although he has no formal training in magic, he has an extraordinary amount of experience and understanding in the field. From some of his experiences, I deduce that he is in direct touch with some higher intelligence, possibly his guardian angel. He describes his angel as a beautiful winged woman with red hair whom he calls the Empress and who has guided him through his life and saved him many times. He is the most polemic person I have ever met and is in complete accord with our own principles. The meeting and friendship of Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard was akin to two unknown subatomic particles colliding within the vortex of post-World War II America, and from this impact a new social, cultural and mythological universe came into creation. When the father of US space exploration and a future author of Dianethics met, it was clear that both men felt a sense of destiny had brought them both together. As with so many other aspects of Jack Parsons' life, there was always an underlying theme of one door opening and another one closing behind him. And his encounter with Hubbard, following his dismissal from Aerojet, was yet another example of this. Following the end of the Second World War, former science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard found returning to civilian life extremely challenging. His family life dissolving, although he did continue to support them financially, and he was also beset with various illnesses and debilitating conditions having been in and out of military hospitals, while surviving by means of government disability payments, as he was unable to recommence his career as a writer. Through a series of circumstances, after having left the family home in Washington State, Hubbard found himself at the door of the Agape Lodge in Pasadena, initially to live in his trailer outside the mansion, but when one of the tenants vacated, Hubbard then found himself living inside the parsonage proper. Instantly, his own charismatic personality came to the fore, wooing Parsons and the rest of the community with his tales of wartime adventures and often comical stories of life in the Navy during World War II. His travel outside the United States had been near impossible for civilians for the better part of a decade. Hubbard found an eager audience within the lodge as he conveyed to them endless stories of his visits to foreign and exotic places. The women within the Agape Lodge were also sexually drawn towards Hubbard, and like Jack Parsons he also held himself one by one to the erotic opportunities on offer within the group. During this time, Hubbard had also become fascinated with Thelema and the prospect of ritual magic. As Hubbard proved himself to have a complex understanding of the magical tradition from his own personal research. The future founder of the Church of Scientology, 
was very eager to take part in the real thing. This delighted Jack Parsons no end as Hubbard was the magical collaborator which he had been looking for. Grady, Lewis, McMurtry and Parsons, although mutually respectful of one another's ability, were two very different personalities unsuited for such a collaborative task. Especially as McMurtry moved up the ranks of the OTO by winning the favour of Crowley and the more established elements within the organisation. Herbert, on the other hand, arrived as a clean slate, uninterested in becoming an institutional player within the OTO itself. Hubbard was there for the magic alone, and this is what Parsons desired for the Babylon working. To say Parsons was fond of Hubbard would also be an understatement. The two men almost instantly formed a close friendship that, for a period of time, in many ways was stronger than Parsons' friendship with Ed Foreman. Jack Parsons instantly saw a colossal charismatic charge and potential within Hubbard, and which both men came to see as being something of a serendipitous echo of other famous magical pairings from history, such as John Dee and Edward Kelly, not to mention the more immediate Alistair Crowley and Victor Neuber. However, as with all such magical collaborations, and this may well be part of the overall nature of such personality infusions, when brought together for the purpose of working in tandem within magical operations, tensions arose when Sarah Northrup transferred her sexual desires from Parsons to Hubbard. Although on the surface Parsons did everything he could to maintain a liberal and bohemian attitude towards this situation, Deep inside, he was profoundly tormented and saddened. While Parsons was accustomed to men becoming infatuated and even falling in love with Sarah, this time things were different. Sarah was developing a genuine spiritual and romantic connection with Hubbard, and this caused Parsons considerable emotional turmoil. Other members of the lodge reported witnessing Parsons dressed in a black cape and hood conducting after midnight rituals as a kind of magical flagellation upon himself in order to deal with his jealousy and emotional pain. Parsons even conveyed his heartbreak to Alistair Crowley, whom by now he was referring to as my beloved father. Regardless of his hurt, Freighter Tupan was determined to move beyond his emotional state in order to embark upon the Babylon working with Hubbard in the role as Parsons' scribe. Despite having no formal magical training, Parsons was also acutely aware that Hubbard was a natural magician and considered him ideal for the purpose. Both Hubbard and Parsons also came to believe that a powerful guardian angel referred to as the Empress was protecting and guiding Hubbard, now named Freighter H, and which had led him to the Agape Lodge so as to assist Jack Parsons in the completion of the Babylon working. As the harnessing of sexual energy was central to the commencement of the Babylon working itself, Parsons needed someone who would be none phased by his masturbating in front of them so as to attain magical visions from the working while Herbert was to write these visions and events down. Ironically, the sexual tension which arose between Parsons and Herbert over Sarah Northrup would have only amplified the magical intensity of Parsons' magical wand as the male phallus is referred to within the working. Not surprisingly, such magical operations also tend to come with spiritual and psychological risks. As reality is literally changed in real time, the subatomic field is torn asunder, and doors and gates are flung open to other astral realms and altered states of consciousness. It was during such a working in the North African desert when Alistair Crowley summoned forth the demon Koronzon, which left Crowley's scribe Victor Neuburg, a shattered and damaged man who never fully recovered from the experience. This is probably why Crowley in London was somewhat concerned that Parsons and Hubbard were undertaking the Babylon working, especially because part of Crowley's novel Moonchild was to serve as inspiration. In effect, Parsons and Hubbard 
were creating a new system of magic outside the rigid structures of pre-existing ceremonial magical systems, and Crowley's concerns may have been as much driven by jealousy and insecurity as by his fears for the safety of the two men's souls. For you, there is nothing more magical. Only thus can the curse of Saturn be overcome. I see you hate this way, but it is an ultimate time. It is you that have taken the oath. The choice is me or Karanzan. I await you in the city of the pyramids. Between January 4th and on to the 15th, 1946, the initial Babylon working began. Right from the start, Parsons made rudimentary mistakes within the ritual process, including miscalculating the number of days over which the ritual was to occur. These basic errors tell us much about Jack Parsons' emotional state due to the developing situation between Sarah Betty Northrup and L. Ron Hubbard. Parsons' own psychic state had also been altered somewhat by his delving into traditional witchcraft and voodoo as a means to overcome the situation between him and Sarah. Now firmly believing that she now belonged to Hubbard, the Babylon working was as much about Parsons being on a romantic rebound in search of an elemental replacement for Sarah as much as anything which might demonstrate his magical proficiency. There was also increasingly negative paranormal and spiritual activity in the parsonage which Smith and the rest of the Agape Lodge were deeply concerned about, even going as far as contacting Crowley in London in a state of extreme agitation and depression concerning what was unfolding inside the lodge as well as how it was affecting Smith and the other lodge members. This included significant and sudden changes to the local weather in Pasadena directly above the Agape Lodge building, as well as ghostly orbs and other mysterious voices calling out to residents in strange languages. Ed Foreman was terrorized at one point by a screaming banshee howling outside the parsonage, and the experience left him with a profound effect which haunted him for the rest of his life. If anything, the paranormal activity of the Agape Lodge gave testament to the ferocious levels of psychic amplification and attenuation which Parsons' cognition was firing through his nervous system with the same intensity as a rocket motor reaching escape velocity. The gates were already torn open and the diabolical and divine fruits from out of the abyss were dared to be harvested within the mortal realm. Nonetheless, by January 4th, Jack Parsons was more than ready to undertake the Babylon working, with Hubbard as a scribe. Determined to bring the Thelemite goddess Babylon to him using the keys of the Enochian magical script. Central to the early stages of the ritual was the invocation of the Bornless One, or the Headless Rite as it is also known. 
This serves to open the gates into other realms as a kind of a doorman into the non-material worlds. Thee, I invoke, the bornless one. Thee, that didst create the earth and the heavens. Thee, that didst create the night and the day. Thee, that didst create the darkness and the light. Thou art a Soronophris, whom no man hath seen at any time. Thou art Jabas, thou art Japos. Thou hast distinguished between the just and the unjust. Thou didst make the female and the male. Thou didst produce the seed and the fruit. Thou didst form men to love one another and to hate one another. I am Moshe, thy prophet, unto whom thou didst commit thy mysteries, the ceremonies of Israel. Thou didst produce the moist and the dry, and that which nourisheth all created life. Dear thou me, for I am the angel of Paphro Asoronophris. This is thy true name, handed down to the prophets of Israel. Following this, there are also complex salutations and venerations to various angelic beings, gods, the elements, and the cardinal points. At one stage, Hubbard the scribe noted that a message was given by a guardian angel that Jack Parsons had an enemy who wanted to get revenge upon him. This was then followed by an electric sounding voice begging for freedom and other catalytic phenomena taking place. The closing of the ritual includes the acts of banishing, which are as complex and thorough as the opening rites. For every magical door that is unlocked, it must be locked again by turning the same key in the opposite direction. On January 15th, the ritual was completed. Almost immediately, Parsons expressed great disappointment and tremendous despondency as to why the ritual had seemingly failed. A few days later, as a kind of after-ritual pilgrimage, Parsons and Hubbard went deep into the Mojave Desert, and as the sun was setting, a kind of peace came over Parsons and he announced to Hubbard that the ritual had been a great success. Then something truly incredible happened. Parsons was correct. The ritual had been a success. The elemental Babylon goddess had, incredibly, at the same moment when Parsons and Hubbard were watching the setting sun over the Mojave Desert, knocked upon the front door of the Agape Lodge in Pasadena. Of Irish and Dutch ancestry, Marjorie Cameron was born on April 23, 1922, in Belle Plaine, Iowa. Like Parsons, although her family were wealthy, again the Great Depression had taken a serious toll on their finances and social status. Being a highly independent and self-determined child, from an early age she demonstrated a strong artistic inclination to complement her rebellious streak. Sexually active from an early age, her mother once even had to perform an illegal abortion upon her own daughter, which not surprisingly only made Marjorie Cameron more of a maverick within the local community. Her strong artistic drive, however, led her towards initial employment as a graphic designer for local retailers in Belle Plaine. At the outbreak of the Second World War, she was assigned to a prestigious duty within the map-making department of the Navy, and her duties also involved working with high-ranking naval officers as well as major political and cultural figures of the war era. Like Hubbard, 
She was also somewhat lost following her discharge from the U.S. Navy at the end of the war and moved to Los Angeles to pursue a more artistic career. While in Los Angeles and by sheer chance she encountered an old friend who was probably the science fiction author Robert Heinlein who thought she might be interested in visiting the Agape Lodge and meeting the bohemian crowd living at the parsonage on Orange Grove Avenue in Pasadena. Returning home from the Mojave Desert with Hubbard, Parsons instantly recognised Marjorie Cameron as the elemental he had brought into manifestation with the initial Babylon working. She also bore an uncanny resemblance to the woman on the cover of Jack Williams' book, Darker Than You Think, echoing the scarlet-haired woman riding a great beast, as outlined in Alistair Crowley's own magical mythos. The attraction was certainly mutual, and the two made their way to Parsons' bedroom, there to remain together for two whole weeks. Although Cameron was unaware of Parsons' intentions of deliberately impregnating her so as to give birth to an elemental child, she later stated that Parsons had educated her during this two-week session on a mission of vital importance to the world. Upon returning to New York in late February in order to dump her photographer boyfriend, Cameron discovered that she was pregnant and then had an abortion, although there is no indication that the child was actually Parsons. Returning to Pasadena, she had reported witnessing a UFO, and this only confirmed to Parsons that her own magical charismatic charge was generating. At the same time, Parsons was psychologically divorcing himself from the Agape Lodge and focusing his entire magical and spiritual destiny upon Marjorie Cameron. While initially being more of a bewildered novice than a cynical skeptic, Marjorie Cameron was still eager to help in whatever way she could with the second phase of the Babylon working. Parsons was already convinced that her UFO sighting was a significant manifestation indicating that the Babylon process was well underway. With his understanding of quantum theory coupled with his success as a magical practitioner, Parsons was attempting to literally alter the very nature of space-time itself, while tearing open portals into other realities. Marjorie Cameron was to act as a kind of a Telemite Virgin Mary and have the moon child by means of immaculate conception. Some would argue that the explosion in UFO activity in the immediate aftermath following the Babylon working, with the mysterious phenomena of the ghost rocket hysteria in Scandinavia, which began in the middle of the Babylon working itself, followed by waves of UFO activity in North America, the Puget Sound and Roswell events, leading to thousands of others, that Parsons and Hubbard may have actually torn the fabric of space-time asunder. It is also worth noting that the US space program, particularly the Apollo lunar missions, which were a result of Jack Parsons' rocketry workings, were also connected to strange anomalies and UFO sightings reported by the astronauts themselves. Had Jack Parsons known about the ghost rockets of Scandinavia, he would have no doubt seen them as a manifestations of the Ace of Swords, the icy power blade of the Arctic regions with the Lima engraved along its surface, piercing a hole between astral realms, extending all the way from Malkuth the Cather on the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. In Alistair Crowley's Lieber 777, Cather is associated with the Nordic god Woden, or Odin of Scandinavia. 
Parsons and Hubbard's Mule Child was just stating precisely where it should just state. By March 1946, Marjorie Cameron was living with Parsons at the Agape Lodge. Her immediate presence was more than just a replacement for Sarah, as her sexual fluids, along with Parsons, were needed for the second working. This time, Hubbard took a more active role in the operations, with both him and Parsons sharing the role of the scribe. With classical music setting the atmospheric mood towards building up the charge, and an electric recording device was also being used to pick up any audio phenomenon which might occur during the ritual. Parsons was now scrying the ether for messages from the astral planes, following a specific set of protocols for the progression of the operation to be implemented on the second day, that being March 2nd, when the follow-up Babylon working was to commence proper. One, the lesser ritual of the hexagram. Two, excerpt from the Gnostic Mass. Three, excerpt from Crowley's The Vision and the Voice. Four, a short verse dedicated to Babylon. Five, the key call of the seventh heir. Six, Excerpt from Crowley's Tannhäuser. The next few days presented a more intense version of the previous workings, with a strong emphasis on the goddess Isis. The operating framework of the ritual being based upon elements in Alistair Crowley's 1917 novel Moonchild. The objective being the generation of a magical child which is an infant born as a product of its environment rather than its genetics. This was then to be symbolically impregnated within Marjorie Cameron, truly making her the Thelemite goddess Babylon. According to Cameron, her pregnancy would eventually take nine years for her to give birth to the moon child within her, finally becoming the total earthly materialization of Babylon. When Alistair Crowley found out about the Babylon working, he was infuriated, referring to Parsons and Hubbard as idiotic louts. Again, once more, this may have been a result of Crowley's insecurity that they were developing a new system of magic beyond the Lima that was getting powerful results and would then go on to generate enormous social and cultural changes, which in time Hubbard and Parsons most certainly achieved. As previously, upon completion of the ritual, once again a kind of peace came over Parsons and a new stage in his life was beginning. He sold the parsonage for $25,000 under the condition that he and Marjorie Cameron could continue to remain as tenants in one of the outbuildings. Parsons then chose Roy Leffingwell to be his successor as the head of the Agape Lodge, finally bringing the unique community at 1003 South Orange Grove Boulevard to an end. As the 1940s were coming to a close, Jack Parsons turned his attention towards new business opportunities, including forming a company with Sarah and Hubbard called Allied Enterprises. Part of the reason for this was to avoid paying income tax owed on substantial savings at the time. Sarah Betty Northrup contributed nothing to the partnership, while Hubbard brought forward the idea to purchase yachts in Florida which were then to be sailed through the Panama Canal and sold into the California market at a substantial profit. By this point Ed Foreman had become wary of the relationship between Sarah Northrup and L. Ron Hubbard, believing that Jack Parsons was being too trusting and honourable in his opinion of them both. 
Foreman and Jack Parsons, other friends, who also realised what was happening, were unfortunately proven to be correct. His ex-sister-in-law and former girlfriend, and seemingly also his trusted magical partner, had decided to take all the money and go on a world cruise, using the $20,000 which Parsons had personally invested into Allied Enterprises. Ironically, it was none other than Alistair Crowley who finally got Parsons to accept his naivety and Parsons soon took legal action against the pair, who by then were ostensibly on the run. Upon discovering their whereabouts, Parsons implemented a magical working upon Sarah Northrup and L. Ron Hubbard via the geomantic invocation of Bart Sabel, a vengeful entity connected to the planet Mars. This led them to come ashore due to a sudden and unexpected storm and into the hands of the US legal system. Hubbard attempted to escape me by sailing at 5 p.m. and I performed a full evocation to Bart Sabel within the circle at 8 p.m. At the same time, so far as I can check, his ship was struck by a sudden squall off the coast, which ripped off his sails and forced him back to port, where I took the boat in custody. Here I am in Miami pursuing the children of my folly. They cannot move without going to jail. However, I am afraid that most of the money has already been dissipated. Although history has tended to exclusively blame Hubbard for the swindling of Parsons, Further investigation reveals that most likely Sarah Northrup was the true pathological guiding force behind scamming Jack Parsons. Possibly right back to the initial rival of Hubbard at the Agape Lodge. After all, we are talking about a woman who stole her sister's own husband as soon as her back was turned. When Sarah Northrup realised she was not going to get away with Jack Parsons' money, she suddenly declared that she would prosecute Parsons for statutory rape. This led to the case against her being dropped. Parsons was so impoverished from all this that he was no longer able to financially support his ex-wife Helen and her child by Wilfred Smith, which he had been doing so up until that point. In the end, Parsons received nearly $3,000 compensation from L. Ron Hubbard. Sarah Northrup, who paid nothing into the formation of Allied Enterprises, almost certainly walked away with the rest of the missing cash. Her life from that point on was a typical borderline personality type existence of unsubstantiated accusations and smear campaigns in which she eventually gave L. Ron Hubbard as her husband the full hostility of her personality which she previously threatened to unleash upon Jack Parsons. There is one more element to this strange tale and that being the belief among some that science fiction author Robert Heinlein was working as a US government agent within the Agape Lodge and that he was sabotaging it from within. Being the one it is speculated who played a major role in bringing Herbert and Sarah Northrup together in order to create two factions within the Agape Lodge so as to destroy it. Sarah Northrup most certainly demonstrated being personality disordered and generally hid it behind her good looks and sexuality. What makes this theory even more interesting is that Robert Heinlein, upon his death, who was also strongly connected to US naval intelligence, was that his widow destroyed all his personal papers and records of his time in Pasadena when he was more central to the Agape Lodge than history generally records of him. Robert Heinlein's science fiction stories generally paint a conformist machine-like future where ideas of the spiritual nature of humans have been eradicated and replaced with conformist liberal patriotism. His future being hard and cold with no room for magic and the mystical. In this regard, Jack Parsons would have represented everything Heinlein despised. And this does ask the question as to why he became so embedded within the bohemian and esoteric community on South Orange Grove Boulevard. Not to mention, 
Why did the social dynamics of the Lodge begin to disintegrate as soon as he became a regular attendee? The success and popularity of the Agape Lodge in Pasadena was very much a result of the house that Jack built, and there were many who wanted to see it torn down, and none more so than conformist, scientific materialist Robert Heinlein. In the end, Parsons was so distraught by the entire saga that he resigned from the OTO and both he and Cameron left the parsonage for good to recommence their life together with a fresh start. For the remainder of the 1940s, the Parsons set about rebuilding their lives with some success as Jack returned his attention to science and married life. L. Ron Hubbard was to go on to enjoy spectacular success with his book Dianetics which in so many ways was a product of the magical philosophy and techniques derived from Thelema as well as Parsons' personal influence upon the founder of Scientology. Back in June 1937, Frank Molina and Jack Parsons began collaborating on a novel and movie script in which a group of idealistic young rocket scientists used their abilities to promote anti-war, pseudo-Marxist aims. The characters in the novel and provisional movie script were all based on individuals in and around Caltech at the time, and which reflected attributes of their various personalities within the story's characters. The character based upon Jack Parsons was a dashing, brilliant rocket engineer named Theophile Belvedere. At the end of the story, Belvedere is killed accidentally by an explosion in his own laboratory. Fifteen years later, on the evening of June 15, 1952, the quiet streets around Pasadena were rocked by a loud bang. This was followed by a second bang, which was more clearly identifiable as an explosion, and was heard over a mile away from 1017 and a half South Orange Grove Boulevard, where the Parsons were living at the time and from where the two loud bangs had originated. Making their way through the devastation, two neighbours who were also lodgers on the property found Jack Parsons lying on the floor of his home laboratory. His right forearm was missing, his legs and his left arm were clearly broken, and a gaping hole was torn in the right side of his face, penetrating deep into his skull. Yet incredibly, he was still alive, but unable to clearly communicate. Jack Parsons was rushed to Huntington Memorial Hospital, where he died less than an hour later. His last words were reported to have been, I wasn't done. Upon hearing about her son's death, Jack Parsons' mother Ruth committed suicide by poisoning herself, unable to continue on living without her son. At the time of the explosion, Marjorie Cameron was out purchasing supplies for a business and vacation trip they had been planning to take in Mexico, which they were to go on the following morning. Aware of the extent of her husband's injuries, she was understandably unable to bring herself to see his mutilated body, sending a friend to the morgue instead. The police soon determined that there was no proof of foul play and that Jack Parsons had been killed when he accidentally dropped the coffee can containing fulminate of mercury 
onto the floor and which had exploded as he was trying to catch it before it hit the ground. At the time, he was working to create some special effects for a movie studio who had contacted him. The initial explosion which blew his arm off was then exacerbated by the fulminate of mercury causing a chain reaction with several other chemicals stored in the room. This is what caused the second explosion, blowing the doors off the building. However, very few accepted this ruling of accidental death, as Parsons was known to be extremely diligent in his handling of chemicals, having been credited for his work safety practices during his time in the explosives industry. He was also working inside his own home, and this made the accidental explosion theory even less plausible to some. Jack Parsons was not a reckless scientist. This is a mythology which has grown up in recent years that he was somehow cocky and casual when working with dangerous chemicals. Nothing could be further from the truth. Many people readily suspected that Jack Parsons more likely had been murdered with a bomb, especially as it was noted that the floorboards where the explosion took place appeared to be blasted upwards as if an explosive device had been concealed below them. Parsons himself had been convinced the FBI had been spying on him for some time, as he had been contacted by the Israeli government, who were offering him a lucrative career as a rocket scientist if he moved to the new state. At the time, Israel was not a strong ally of the USA, and any US rocket expert moving there would have been considered a danger to national security even if by this stage Werner von Braun and many former Nazi scientists recruited via Operation Paperclip were already, and it has to be said ironically, working in the USA on developing rockets, while Jack Parsons, the one individual who should have been front and center of the emerging US space program, had to look to continuing his career elsewhere. There were also old scores to be settled by elements within the Los Angeles Police Department for Parsons' role in the conviction of Earl Kenyette. Kenyette had already been released from prison by the time of Parsons' death and would have known how to make and plant a bomb, having been convicted in assembling the pipe bomb which had landed him in prison thanks almost exclusively to Jack Parsons' courtroom testimony. At one point, even Howard Hughes was made suspect, as Parsons, during his brief time working there, had stolen industrial secrets from the company. Although the so-called theft was a 17-page document which Parsons himself had written and taken home from the Hughes facility, it was an error in judgment for which he accepted complete responsibility, partially out of protecting another Hughes employee from being fired which was typical of Jack Parsons' innate sense of decency. In the end, the cause and reason for Jack Parsons' death were soon lost in the brief media sensationalism, which swirled around his occultic beliefs and his necromancy. In no time, the media interest eventually died down, and Parsons' widow and friends were left to deal with the aftermath. Perhaps the most sympathetic and fitting tribute was paid by Aerojet, the company he had founded, who in an official statement said, Jack Parsons, he liked to wander, but he was one of the top men in the field. The OTO held a Gnostic Mass in his honour, while a private prayer service was held at the Pasadena Crematorium. Marjorie took his ashes to the location in the Mojave Desert where the Babylon working had taken place, and Jack Parsons, the brilliant, still young rocket scientist who was instrumental in developing the discoveries and inventions which would eventually lead to the creation of NASA and the Apollo Moon program, was scattered into the eternity of the desert wind to fall among the grains of sand where the moon child had been brought into being by the manifestation of his elemental and wife, Marjorie Cameron. If there is one term that could be used to describe Jack Parsons, it would be Renaissance Man. 
His brilliant mind was awash in every manner of creativity and insight, from science to art to mysticism to philosophies. If he had been born in Italy 500 years ago, the world would have remembered him alongside Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo and Brunelleschi. Yet at the same time, Southern California, among the Hollywood Hills, the Mojave Desert and the orange groves of Pasadena was perhaps the perfect alchemical vessel for Jack Parsons to create his own spectacular monument that reached all the way from Aurora Seco and into the deepest regions of the cosmos. Every time an American rocket reaches escape velocity, that is Jack Parsons' pure stream of magical energy made manifest. Babylon is the flame of life, power of darkness. She destroys with a glance. She may take thy soul. She feeds upon the death of men, beautiful, horrible. She shall absorb thee, and thou shalt become living flame before she incarnates. Boom, boom, bang, bang, rocket ship. Boom, boom, bang, bang, rocket ship. Yeah. Uh-huh.